Hello and welcome to worship at Good Shepherd's Lutheran Church. Uh, we're gathered uh, not in person but, but in spirit to celebrate the, the great things God has done for us. Uh, today we will be celebrating Palm Sunday. Uh, the crowds gathered together and cried out, Hosanna, save us, is what Hosanna means. Save us, Lord. And so we are gathered to, to cry out the same thing. Save us, Lord. And as Holy Week would unfold, we see our Lord most certainly doing that saving us. And so with confidence we gather uh, to, to hear that same message, that our Lord has saved us. We'll begin the worship uh, service with hymn number 130, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and, and merciful, merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have, I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, 
a sinner. sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, Christ have, have mercy. mercy. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Christ. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Amen. Amen. for the great acts of love by which you redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ. As he was acclaimed by those who scattered their garments and branches of palm in his path, so may we always hail him as our King and follow him with perfect confidence, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson today is taken from the New Testament Epistle to the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Paul begins by telling us that our attitude should be the same as that of Christ, and then he tells us what Jesus' attitude is. For Jesus loved us so much that, as the eternal Son of God, he ruled all things, and yet he came to this earth, lived a life in this sinful world, and suffered and died for us. No pain was too great. No lowliness so low that our Lord's love did not drive him to come and save us. From Philippians chapter 2. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of our God. The Gospel lesson today is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 to 11. 
It's the account of Jesus entering Jerusalem amid great praise on Palm Sunday. And as the true King of heaven and earth enters into the holy city, he is there to suffer and to die for the sins of the world. From Matthew 21. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a, full, on a coal the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the gospel of our Lord. We now continue with our next hymn, hymn 133. mercy and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God which we will consider is from Zechariah chapter 9 verses 9 through 12. I'll, I'll read it to you here in just a few moments. In the name of our triune God, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ our Lord. The words I'm hearing aren't new but I sure seem to be hearing them a lot more frequently than I recall ever hearing them. I'm thinking of words like quarantine and isolation, social and distancing put together. Not heard that one before in my lifetime that I recall. Words like cooped up, cabin fever, or squirrely. As in, we're all feeling a little squirrely because we've been stuck in the house for too long. 
our minds can't escape the fact that we feel this confinement. We feel trapped. There's another word we hear more frequently. I want you to think about what it's like to be trapped this, or in this service. I want you to think about confinement, but not the confinement that we're experiencing right now. Our text from Zechariah chapter 9 speaks to us about us being trapped. The, the real problem that we face in life is not that we're trapped in our homes during this time. The real problem that we face is that we are trapped by sin. Sin imprisons us. We are stuck in it. And although we don't always face the consequences of our sins immediately, and so we don't always feel trapped by our sins, it's no less true, or it's nonetheless true, we are trapped in our sins. I cannot make my selfishness into something that is God-pleasing. We may all try, but it just can't be done. Or our lies, or our greed, or our lust, or our anger, or our laziness, or pick the sin. We can't turn those into God-pleasing things. We are trapped in them. Because the scriptures say that we deserve God's punishment, his eternal punishment for those sins. Sin is a very real trap, a prison that humanity cannot on its own break out of. By ourselves, we are chained to eternal judgment. The word of God before us is from Zechariah chapter 9, and the text talks to us about being trapped. And it's the traditional reading, the Zechariah 9 lesson. It's the traditional Old Testament lesson for Palm Sunday, because as we hear at the, in the first verse, it's the words that Matthew quoted in our gospel lesson about a king riding into Jerusalem on a colt. It's talking about Christ. But I'm going to read a little bit more than just the traditional reading for Palm Sunday, because as the reading goes on, it talks about the results of Jesus riding into Jerusalem. And that's what I want you to think about today. Our text starts in, in Zechariah 9 with what we heard in our gospel lesson. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, Gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. We know the humble man that's being prophesied about here in Zechariah 9 is Jesus Christ himself, who would ride into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday humbly on a colt, not looking all that regal and royal, but he would ride into Jerusalem to battle his enemies as our king. He would battle his worldly enemies, but more importantly, to battle our spiritual enemies. Jesus went to Jerusalem prepared to take on sin and death and hell. That's why he had gone there. As we sang in the, the hymn, hymn number 130, Jesus rode into Jerusalem in lowly pomp, ride on to die. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen during Holy Week. He knew that the week ended with his lifeless body placed into a tomb. And he knew how the life got sucked out of that body in the most horrific way. A crucifixion is how he would be killed. He knew all that. But he knew it needed to be done. Because he knew that his death would be payment for sin would be the punishment that the world deserved for sin. Jesus knew that although he was the one who had never sinned, he could be made guilty of all sin, of every sin, and punished for it. And so he would ride on in lowly pomp. He would ride on to die. Jesus went to Jerusalem knowing what would happen. And again, as we said, sang in the hymn, he would ride in majesty. For although he looked lowly, we know what he went there to do. 
He went there to be the glorious savior of the world. To take away every sin, to destroy death. Zechariah's prophecy here in Zechariah 9 is just a little sliver of the life of Christ. Riding into Jerusalem on a colt. But from that little glimpse of Jesus' life, he could see the results of what would come. The release and the peace and the freedom that Christ would establish. Zechariah chapter 9 continues, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. I will, I will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the watery pit. Jesus riding into Jerusalem, we know the rest of the story, to suffer and to die and to rise, would establish peace. The peace that's pictured here in Zechariah 9 is he uses word pictures about a war that was ended and weapons that were useless. But the peace that's described here is far greater than, than a peace between nations. He's talking about peace between sinners and God. Peace established by the blood of my covenant. By the blood of Christ, we are reunited with God. We are brought back together with him. No longer estranged and God's enemies... No longer imprisoned in sin, we are now freed and forgiven and made into God's people. Set free, Zechariah says, from the waterless pit, from the pit of hell, from the pit of guilt and shame. We are reunited with God. But then the text goes on to say we're still trapped. I want you to picture or, or follow along the thoughts here in Zechariah 9. It starts with, with Jesus riding into Jerusalem to establish peace, to set us free. And then the text goes on to talk about how we're still trapped. This is what it says. Return to your fortress, O prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. Because Jesus rode into Jerusalem, because he suffered and he died and he rose, Zechariah says we are still trapped. We are prisoners, but we're prisoners of hope. We are entrapped, imprisoned in hope because of all that Jesus Christ has done for us. We can't help wherever we look. We can't help but see reasons to hope because we know what Jesus Christ has done for us. Faith sees this hope. When we look around our world, we see reasons to despair, right? Things like, well, now it's coronavirus that causes us to despair. When will this end? How will this end? When will my life ever get back to normal? But the truth is, we know that this will end. But when it does end, it won't be the last problem that we face. There'll be something else down the road. Whether it be like this one on a national scale or, more frequently, on a very personal scale as we wrestle with problems. We live in a sinful world. And living in this sinful world we can feel trapped by the problems that just happen all too frequently here. But it's actually worse. For as we said before, we're trapped in sin. We see it in our own lives. We struggle against it, but, but never achieve perfection. We continue to fail. And then along comes the devil, as he did earlier in Zechariah. Back in chapter 3, he played his role as the accuser. Accusing the high priest, Joshua, of sin. And the devil does that to us too. He's not actually lying when he points out that we have failed, that we have sinned, and we feel trapped. 
and reasons to despair grow within us. But here in Zechariah 9, after telling us that Christ would ride into Jerusalem to suffer and to die and to establish peace, the prophet says, Return to your fortress, O prisoners of hope. You are not trapped in sin. Christ has set you free. He has washed away every one of of your sins. Nor are you trapped in this sinful world in which you need to despair because it's, well, it's sinful. For you have been set free and made into God's child. You are trapped in hope, it says here in Zechariah 9. You are trapped in the hope of knowing that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior and that he will never leave you. That he came to proclaim peace to the nations. And that peace that he proclaims to the nations, he proclaims to you. He proclaims it in the promises of his forgiveness, and the promises that he will never leave you. This peace, this hope that we have, is not just some pious fantasy, but it's based in the reality the reality of what Jesus Christ did, that he rode into Jerusalem in fulfillment to this prophecy, and then he would be pierced in fulfillment of prophecy to suffer and die for us, to rise for us. Our hope is based on the reality of what God has done to save us. The water of baptism really dripped down on your head, and so those promises of God are yours. That he loves you and has saved you. The word of God proclaims again and again. Countless promises. That your God has claimed you as his own. That he forgives you and he will not leave you. And so we are trapped. Imprisoned. In hope. Everywhere we look. Whatever we see it's filtered through what Jesus Christ has done for us. And how he has saved us. The promises of God overcome the dire circumstances in which we may or may not find ourselves. God is with us. Christ has freed us from sin. We are trapped in the promise of eternal life. Whether it be coronavirus or the next crisis that comes along. Or that time just passes by and eventually I die. I will eventually die. We're trapped though. Trapped in the promise that we will live forever in heaven. That nothing can can take away what Christ has done for us. That his death and resurrection mean we're set free from every sin and that we will live in heaven. We're trapped in the promise that God will work all things for the good of his people and that he guides history along with the good of his church in mind, you in mind. We're trapped in that thinking. We're stuck there. It's a glorious place to be stuck, isn't it? We're stuck hoping, trusting that our God, the God who died for us and rose for us, the God who has ascended back to heaven and rules all things for us, continues to watch over us, continues to to look out for his people and to bless them. And so Zechariah says to us that we are trapped. We cannot escape this hope. We can't get out of it because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. This is our our joyful fortress built by the blood of Christ. This is our, our prison. This hope that our God will never leave us. And everywhere we turn and everywhere we look, as we are trusting in Christ, We see reason to hope. As you are cooped up or isolated or trapped in your home, don't forget this picture that God sets before us here in Zechariah chapter 9. You are also trapped in a fortress, in a prison of hope. Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem to suffer and die for you. He accomplished the work that needed to be done so that you could be God's child. And with that work accomplished, you're trapped. 
You're trapped in the love of God. You're trapped in the hope that your God will work all for, you, all for your good. And so people of God live as prisoners. Prisoners of hope. Who never, never give up. But always trust that the Lord who has saved us will never leave us. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding will guard and will keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We will continue by confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord Jesus, you are the King of heaven and earth. We join the first Palm Sunday worshipers in praising and glorifying you, glorifying you for coming to this earth to be our Savior. Though you are one with God the Father and Lord of all, you humbled yourself and became one with us. Thanks be to you for living a perfect life under God's holy law in our place. Cause our voices to blend with those who sang your praises as you rode into Jerusalem. Move us to confess you before others as our Lord. Help us proclaim the message of peace and forgiveness to people of all nations. And Lord Jesus, you are king over all the earth. Bless the nations of this world with wise rulers and good government. Let peace prevail. Grant success to businesses and the industries of our land. Look with, honest, look with favor on our nation's schools. Be with those who teach and those who learn. Comfort the sick and the afflicted with the assurance of your care and protection. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Dear Savior, as we walk with you this week toward Calvary, keep us focused on your purpose for coming into this world and on our calling to spread this wonderful message of salvation. Hear us for your mercy's sake. Amen. And hear us as we join to pray as you taught us. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We now close with hymn 3, verses 1 and 5.
Hello again and welcome uh, to, to worship here on Palm Sunday. The announcements that we have are very similar to what we've had in the past, printed for you in the, the worship folder that's online. I would add a couple of to that, uh, included in an email earlier this week, and we will try to include these links uh, in emails that will be coming up. But on Palm Sunday evening, President Schrader, the president of our synod, at 6 p.m. will be addressing the synod. It will be a live uh, stream if you would like to watch it then. It will also be recorded, so if you're not there ex exactly 6, you can watch the recording of it later. And then on Easter evening, also at 6 p.m., uh, our synod will be, is putting together a worship service that will take place at the, our seminary's chapel uh, with the seminary president, uh, Pastor Earl Trepto, as the preacher. And again, that will be live streamed and also recorded. You are invited to, to uh, make use of those extra worship resources. Uh, as I said, both will be in, the links will be in the emails that we will send out.